What would it take to arouse your life, to experience more connection, more pleasure, more realness in and outside of the bedroom? I'm August McLaughlin, and this is Girl Boner Radio. And so I'll start asking them, what are the scents that you like? What are the colors? What textures? How can you bump up your relationship to your body in other ways that we can then transfer over into your sex life? What are the expectations you have about your body, your partner's body? What sex is that old programming about, you know, sex is orgasm and sex is penetration. That's not always helpful. It can be so much more than that. How do we slow down, go deep, and expand moments that then become rich and, one of your favorite words, luscious? Hey, everyone. Today, I'm sharing an episode from last September because... With pleasure, managing trauma triggers for more vibrant sex and relationships just turned one. As you may know, I co authored this book with sex therapist Jamila Dawson, and we are both so grateful that it's been out in the world and resonating with folks. You'll hear our conversation about how the book came together, the challenges, and the fulfilling parts and a theme that runs through it, cultivating pleasure practices, why they matter, what they might look like, and how they can enhance our lives and our sexual experiences. You'll also hear from several courageous survivors that we featured in the book talking about their own pleasure practices. Keep listening after the show for excerpts from my very first conversation with Jamila, It's from the day we first met in person in 2019, and it's basically a mini bonus episode tagged on to the end. Thank you for being here to celebrate in this way. I really hope you enjoy the show. So I was thinking back to the day that I met you in person in the studio. I was excited to have you on. I knew a little bit about your work and really appreciated it. And you came in and, and sat down. And I remember feeling very, first of all, at ease, you have this, this way about you that I think folks feel really comfortable speaking and sharing, I felt like we were really in the space together. And as you were talking, I was so struck by everything you were saying about pleasure and trauma, managing trauma versus, you know, versus treating trauma, like the terminology that was so impactful for me and the metaphors you were using. And I was having these thoughts of, oh my gosh, I had had this book idea and I really want this person to be in this book, this incredible expert. And I just got chills just thinking about that moment because it was so visceral to me. And I know because of conversations we've had since when I brought the book up to you, you did not have that same like, oh yeah, feeling for very good reasons. Right. What do you recall about meeting and then learning about this project? I think one of the ways that I've kind of had to navigate professional Um, experiences like being on a podcast, I I just have this, um, I'm going to go into it. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to have a conversation and hope that it's a good experience. What I realize now is like, I go into it pretty protected. And so what I recall from the day was, you know, okay, I'm here to do this, hop in, do my thing and go. And the experience itself was a good conversation. Like I felt, oh, this was very professional. And then I was done. Or so you thought. (laughs) Or so I thought. (laughs) And so when I got this very pleasant email asking me to to consider doing the foreword, I thought, oh, well, it was a pleasant experience and this is a great idea. 
so why not? And then when you asked me later in another message of what I consider actually being a co-author, I just remember shock. Oh my goodness, like this is, this would mean working with this person who I don't really know after having my experience. I had had an experience with a a very well-known sex educator who I had known for some time. Their work was one of the, the things that inspired me to become a sex educator. So I had a lot of very positive feelings about this person. And what I thought had been a friendship had developed. And then in a professional context, this person made an extremely racist comment that they then doubled down on and never apologized for, uh, and then subsequently cut off our friendship. And it was just very shocking, the humiliation, embarrassment of when they made this racist comment in front of other white people. It was, it was awful. And so then a week later, I get this very pleasant email from this very nice white woman sex educator, and it all just kind of slammed together. When you described the shock of when you heard that comment, that made me really think about how the whole journey, when you said, this is working with a person, like the potential for this, working on this book, it's, it's a, a relationship, like it's, it's going to be time. And so I may seem really friendly up front and for who knows how long, you know, and to have to have to not know where it would go had to be really, really scary. It was scary. It was scary. And our first conversation, phone conversation where, you know, it was, it was, I don't want to say a testing conversation was more of a tasting conversation of if I share with this person kind of where I'm at and they respond in a not supportive or even curious way, then that tells me that this is not the project for me. And it's okay to say no. It's okay to say this is not for me. But if they show up in a way that feels inviting, then I can take the next step. And so we had our conversation and it was shocking in a good way of, oh, I shared where I was and August listened and supported in a way that was thoughtful and measured and didn't feel insincere, it felt right enough to take the next step. Mm, It felt right enough. Right enough. I love that. That phrase sounds very, very appropriate for where you were at. You know, there wasn't going to be a a certainty. There, There could have been. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember that conversation very well. And I remember something that I continually learn from you all along the way. I've learned this from you about our boundaries, about speaking up for our needs. I remember in that conversation, you were bringing up things like I may need to have a third party who can be supportive and look over all of our materials. And, and that meant a lot to me. I mean, I also was feeling the, you know, tenderness of, oh my goodness, I, I asked you something that also brought up pain. And so feeling the care around that and the vulnerability and the strength that that requires for you to even consider this, but then just in awe, you are just exquisite with your boundaries and, and your, your needs. And I, I just, I love that I can learn from you. I've, I've learned so much from you about pleasure and and trauma through writing this book and even through our first interview and the content you share. But then personally, I'm always learning from you. Thank you for saying that. Boundaries are, they are challenging. And any grace and fluency that you've seen with me around boundaries is, woo, therapy and time and reading and tears. I would also say kind of the shedding of shame of, I get to have needs. I get to have boundaries and there should be a reasonable expectation that they'll be respected. So to to be in relationship with you over this time of this is somebody who's going to help me uphold my own boundaries and accept them as legitimate. That's been another element of healing, this whole process. There's definitely been times, as we both know, through this process of being profoundly uncomfortable between the pandemic, between my own stuff that was coming up, 
trying to support clients while, you know, the stuff in my life is being very complicated. And so to build this this relationship with you and practice these things, the pleasure, the boundaries. <laughs> very meta the whole experience has been very meta very well put yes incredibly meta even in the book we talk about that we are we are all students we are all teachers we are all learning and and we really did have to apply all the things that we were talking about including what is at the forefront which is pleasure yes this book went through a couple of titles at first it was called triggered Then someone we won't name wrote a book with that title that is basically the antithesis of ours. Then it was The Trigger Trap, a title we both had mixed feelings about. And then Jamila came up with the current title, the one that stuck. One day it sort of appeared before her eyes. Well, this this idea of pleasure has been this practice that I've been trying to engage in in the last few years. And so I try to put it in places in my life to keep reminding me. Um, So I end a lot of emails with, with pleasure, Jamila. I think I was typing you something about something else, like related to the books and writing something. And then I looked at my email signature with pleasure. And I thought, what if that, I mean, I know maybe it's weird because it's just my email signature, but that's what I believe. So let me just ask August. And so typed you and said, you know, what do you think about with pleasure? And your response was like, yes. it was that yes. I <laughs> love it. I have loved it since the moment you brought it up. To me, it says with pleasure means that we can be going through anything and pleasure is available to us. This is the practice in those two words um, is what we've been trying to do in our process, what the book was about. When you think about pleasure practices and the people whose stories we feature, is there one that stands out? Maybe one that especially struck a chord with you on a personal level? I mean, first of all, I, every time I, I think about all the different interviewees, I just am honored that they're all part of the book and and some way they're they're kind of this literary family that we've created i'd have to say like kirby's story is the one that continues to to haunt me kirby brown died tragically at what was marketed as a spiritual self-help event during a dangerous activity that she and other attendees were told would be scary and might even feel like dying I interviewed her mom and sister, Ginny and Jean, for the book. And I think it's because with the other folks in our book, they're frankly alive to keep figuring out their lives and to keep having their different pleasure practices. And so there's this process that they can engage in. And I am haunted that Kirby does not have that opportunity. Sometimes I, I just say hi to her spirit. I know there's art and things that she created. So there is still like the world is different that she was here. I feel like I have a very special connection to all of the stories. There are a couple that resonated with me and continue to on a really personal level, but that I also learned so much from in the ways that I do not relate. So one is Renee Brooks' story and then Taylor Leanne Chandler. Some of the ways that I I don't relate and, and things that I can learn about, you know, I haven't dealt with the systemic oppression and the trauma that comes from that for someone who's black, such as Renee, or for someone who is intersex, transgender, was a sex worker, but those are all Taylor's experience. So I learned a lot. And then also I related on a really deep level because both of them were able to access pleasure more fully in their lives 
by gaining understanding of how their, their brains work in different ways. So Renee was diagnosed with ADHD, which I have been as well. And then Taylor was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And both of them also had to find their way to the ideal ways to manage and function and thrive with the brains that they have. And in both cases, that's very multifaceted. And they also both really benefit from medication that they need. And I do as well. And it has been such a a life-changing experience for me to work with my brain chemistry. And one thing that I'm very frustrated with in the quote unquote self-help world, which Kirby's story brings so much light to the dark parts of it, is that so often I hear self-help kind of gurus and life coaches shaming medication. And that really gets to me. I know that there are issues with big pharma, and I think we can talk about that and also not shame (laughs) the things that people need. Right. That this is, we have glasses and we have aspirin and we have other elements that humans have developed to help us be all that we can. It's enraging to me that people will go out of their way to, to shame somebody for trying to create an ecology, because that's really what it is. This is not, I'm just relying on one thing or the other, but I'm trying to create an ecology that helps me work with myself, that helps me be, have access to all of me so I can do my life. And um, that's something I, I really want to encourage people that if somebody is telling you to cut things out, I would look askance at those folks. It's going to be multiple pillars that support somebody to do their life. Throughout With Pleasure, we talk about the importance of pleasure in our journeys and especially while managing trauma. Here's a quote from Chapter 6, which is about dealing with that feeling that healing is taking too long. The possibilities for pleasure are endless when we expand our definition of what it can entail and commit to prioritizing pleasure as a practice. Following that is a text box that reads, Pleasure practices can become a rebellious FU to trauma-based triggers and bolster your healing journey at the same time. Over the past couple of weeks, I spoke with several of the folks whose personal stories and insights are featured in the book about their own pleasure practices. Here they are in their own words. My name is Jean Brown, and my pleasure practice is getting up before the rest of my family to do a quick workout. So typically I will lay out my clothing for the workout the night before so that it's like literally right at the end of my bed and it's very easy to just get into it. And I follow a program called Mama Strong, which is specifically geared to women who are pregnant or who have had children. And it's like a 15 minute high intensity workout. Um, They put out a different one every day and I find that doing that is just like, it sets the tone for the rest of the day that I've done something nice for myself. In a lot of ways, sometimes we take pleasure for granted as something that we sort of receive very passively. And I think especially for people who are busy or just kind of in our modern life, like we have to be a bit more active about cultivating our pleasure. So to me, it's that I've taken the space to do something good for myself. It makes me feel good in terms of my energy levels and how I feel in my body. And it impacts like a whole range of other aspects of my own personal pleasure. When I feel that I've done these things for myself, I feel better about myself. I feel more confident. I feel sexier. Like all of these positive aspects are really good. So...
Hello, my name is Taylor Leanne Chandler, and my pleasure practice is escaping my thoughts and being in the moment so someone can take me out of my own head to breathe, release, and become pleasure. I think the biggest thing for me was realizing that triggers from trauma in the past aren't what's happening now. It's my body remembering the trauma. For me, over the past six years of really working at maintaining intimacy, it's been about realizing that I have that power now. You know, my body is not going to be allowed to betray me. But of course, initially, it took someone to take me out of my own head, my trauma, and make me feel all woman, pretty, seductive, sexy, and do things I wouldn't normally do, but be okay with it and and like it and want it again and know that was okay. One quick, you know, disclosure, I do um, live with borderline personality disorder. So I feel things to extremes. That's the best way to put it. And it doesn't necessarily mean I'm feeling good or bad about what's actually happening in the moment. It could be something in that moment that reminds me. But then in the past, it would run as like a movie reel. So you go to the beginning to the end. Well, obviously, we all know that's pretty destructive. So for me, to take my head out of it in that moment and change those thoughts, it sounds simple, but it's almost like I'm outside my body looking at myself and I'm telling myself what you're feeling isn't real you have control now and no one can tell you what is good or bad pleasure for you. For me, it started with masturbation, learning my body, learning me, because then it's easier to teach or tell someone. And that was a big thing for me, talking about sex. I never did that. Now it's like, you can't shut me up. So it's a combination of all those things that lead to that. But for the most part, it's just knowing that I have the control. That's not what's happening right now. So it doesn't discredit the fact that trauma happened, but it releases it from having control over you in that moment. You know, I'm married now two years and my husband is a very sexual being and You know, coming from a past of sex being against my will as a child, raped as a weapon, as a means to survival, it wasn't the things it should be. And even if you grew up perfect, we still are ingrained that sex is taboo and naughty and dirty and secretive. You know, I don't get that because you're so much happier and healthier when you have it with yourself or with a partner or many partners or different partners, you know, but for my husband, I wanted to be those things for him at, what was I, 45? I didn't want to fake an orgasm ever again in my entire life. So part of it was men, in my experience, have a hard time understanding that a woman could have sex and not orgasm in the sense they think of and be okay. A real good orgasm for me is exhausting. And then I want another one. But then if I keep going, I'm tired. And that doesn't go well with getting up, showering, and getting ready for work. But then in those moments where we do have the time, it's been amazing because now I talk about what I want. I ask him what he wants. I'm visual. Who would have thunk it? So I want to see what's happening. It's important. I think in all of these instances, when you realize you don't have to ask for forgiveness to love what you love and like what you like when it comes to sex, love, pleasure, intimacy, because they're all different. My name is Jazz Goldman, and my pleasure practice is scalp care. There are lots of ways to do it, uh, depending on your hair type. But um, part of long-term healing I've been doing from a 
a very extended period of stress that like led to hair loss and other pretty disruptive physical symptoms over 2019 through of course pandemic times has been caring for my hair because um as my health deteriorated during that period i was very disconnected from my body at times and um it basically was from the crown down <laughs> which is just not super functional and um as i was inside all the time through you know now i'm in a new home and environment than when those sort of symptoms first came up. But even though stuff has changed, I'm still holding on to that because I just notice how much I can be with my body in that specific area is a reflection of how much I can be with myself in other ways. So the more that I can dig in and be, you know, not to be too punny, but like at the root of myself um, or at one of them, the better I feel across the board. I actually just did it. <laughs> but the first part is scraping my scalp with my fingernails and nothing else, just under the running water. And I'll do that until I feel like any sort of residual gunk from hair product or like energetic staticiness is, is done. And then my hair is like primed for product. And I'll do, you know, uh, shampooing and conditioning and I like continue with the hair scratches during that and then when I move on to conditioning it's a lot more about feeling my hair um, untangle itself and just like sitting and checking and doing finger uh, untangling which is another technique for black hair care um, some people use combs some people use brushes and that's all fine but I found that especially in the shower hair detangling with my fingers is really powerful. And again, it keeps me super connected because I can feel, you know, every little snag, every little bit that is getting stuck and needs to be untwisted, so to speak. And then when I'm done in the shower, it's probably like an hour of putting one type of oil that's just for my scalp and then using a deep conditioner to deal with the scalp and the rest of the hair. And the order of operations depends. Some people swear that you have to do cream and then oil um, in that order. I sometimes do the opposite um, because I find that by the time I've put conditioner in the hair, there's no like space on my head for the oil to kind of penetrate. You know, there's, there's also a whole bunch of other body awareness pieces that are happening because you know you have to have your arms up over your head <laughs> for a while with with my hair and it would be easy to like get a crick in my neck or like hold myself in you know some kind of effed up posture that is gonna you know leave me in pain in a different area of my body at the whole end of the thing so it's like i'll sit in a what do you call it a folding chair with like a firm seat Sometimes I'll have TV on, sometimes I'll be singing. Yeah, I just sit there making parts, twisting things out, feeling my scalp to see like, okay, is the product penetrating it? Did I miss a spot? Do I need more in this area? All that kind of stuff. That's like the step-by-step -step process. And um, today, because I have a whole lot of anxiety, I made sure to do some singing in the shower. And it was like my own little rock concert in there um it was really nice and i was like shaking my hips while you know doing stuff with my hair so it was very like top to bottom loosening things up and just trying to shake out the energy there's always the the like overarching knowledge for me that this is part of my lineage for my black ancestry. There were many times in my life when I didn't know how to care for my own hair. And like growing up, I was pretty uh, disassociated from my own head because that's just how it sort of played out with how I was brought up. And um, my mom's kindness and concern around how my hair was seen in the world also resulted in me not having a lot of agency around it. Um, until I was a teenager and then I was like going through a rebellious phase and 
not wanting to be ultra feminine or like connected to things that I saw as typically feminine. And it was, it was misogynistic of me at the time, internalized misogyny, but you know, I was 15, so I'm not going to feel too bad about it. <laughs> um, but you know, it's been a weird journey. So like going from that to how I was in like 2019 with my own struggles with health to today, it's, it's a big deal, but it's fun and I like it. I'm Robert. I'm Hannah. So our pleasure practice is to carve out time together to connect intellectually and emotionally before we connect physically. And often that involves like we'll play a word word game like the New York Times Spelling Bee or NPR's Weekend Puzzle and then talk about our week or our day. I struggle a little bit with dissociating during intimacy. And so that really helps counteract that. And so that I'm more present. I'm one of those people who's always raring to go, I think. And the taking time helps me to honor Hannah's needs. And it's something that we developed over three decades, how long have we been together? 33 years, I think. So honoring Rebecca's process with that is another way that for me to feel present for our relationship. It would be really easy for me to not, you know, not pay attention to that. And this is part of my commitment to her. When we've identified a day that our commitment is already, this is, our time together. So I already kind of like have that sort of practice in place in my mind. I'm going to, you know, wake up in the morning. I'm going to have a little time to just be by myself and center in my own body. And then when Robert comes back home, we're going to have some time together to talk. So you know, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about this and that, we're going to talk about anything big that's on our mind, or like just spend a little bit of time connecting. And then um, we might get, you know, snuggly in bed together and do some of our puzzle time. Um, so we'll just get to have that nice, lighthearted kind of, you know, playing with each other, right? And then we might finish with that. And by then, you know, I'll be feeling relaxed and centered and open. And then we can begin with any kind of touching that we feel like. And sometimes we have sort of routines about that. And sometimes we might try something new. And then we just kind of check in with, as Robert touched on a little bit, my need for having um, culmination with like, penetrative sex is is less than his and so while I'm always you know glad to have a pleasurable experience and satisfy what his needs are it's not always that that's what it's going to lead to so we kind of check in about like what I'm in the mood for that day and then we just kind of proceed when she said when I get home I'm up usually at five in the morning but on Saturdays I usually take a six to eight mile hike. Then I come home, I look for a text to see if she's awake. If she isn't, I'll just make some tea and bring it upstairs and sit and watch her sleep. A lot of my career, I worked nights and I'm on a day, Monday through Friday, Friday day now, which is really nice. Um, I'm also a firefighter, so I have sometimes an odd schedule with that. We know at least one day of the week we'll be, you know, there for each other. And it's changed over time. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been together and we have two adult children and we were frisky 20 year olds and now we're looking toward an empty nest. And, you know, that has changed. And when the kids were young, we had a family bed and everyone was in the bedroom, you know, so, mm -hmm. so we had more of an adventure. For, uh, other places in the house to yeah. be together. <laughs> well, it doesn't get boring. <laughs> nope. 
you know, for me, one of my challenges has always been to, um, uh, you know, kind of like stop old patterns around mm -hmm. sexuality and really think about what I like and what I want. And that's actually been a fairly challenging process for me. I don't know if it is for other folks, but that's been a fairly challenging process for me. And I think at different points in my life, I have had different levels of awareness of that. And so I think just kind of being open to checking in with yourself and really thinking about, am I present? Am I enjoying? Is this about me as well as about my partner? And if you find any places where you're like, hey, wait a minute, um, maybe not, um, then those are great places to start to take a look at what would make it more kind of in line. A lot of what Hannah said applies to me too, because of things that happened to me and to her in the past. Honoring each other is, is, is what's been important for me. Part of the things I tried to heal from was the self-centeredness of a wounded person. And so I try to be, you know, open to what, what her needs are and our needs as a couple. My name is Kim Lee Smith and my pleasure practice is lotioning my body. My mother said to me years and years ago, you know, if you ever got, you know, in an ambulance or anything like that, you don't want to be ashy. So to this day, I match my bra and underwear and I lotion my body from head to toe. Now it started out as a chore and now it's become just a real sense of pleasure and joy for me because it keeps my body moist. It keeps my skin nice. Like from head to toe, I will say I have very, very smooth skin. Sometimes you will catch me in a corner rubbing my own arm <laughs> because it feels so good. And there's something about not having dry skin or dry hands. Anybody that knows me well has spent time watching me lotion my body from head to toe, not even in an intimate setting, friends, family, everybody. Oh, here goes Kim Lee lotioning her body. It becomes like this whole thing. I pull out the lotion, I put it on my stand. So it's a whole, it's a, be a beginning, middle and end. So I pull it out. I am excited about the combination while I'm in it. Sometimes it's quick because I'm literally doing it every single day, like right after a shower. If I have an audition or whatever, I'm off to the races. So sometimes it's fast, but still feeling the moisture go into my skin is not only, it, it's almost like the, it's satiating, right? Because I can feel my body drink up the moisture. Every experience of lotioning is a new experience, though it is an all day, every day experience. Like right now, I'll go brush my teeth again and wash my face because I want to take this makeup off. And the first thing I'll do is reapply the moisture on my hands and my face because I've had a busy morning and then I feel revived. But I love that. I love taking care of myself in that way. I love to put socks on so the moisture gets even deeper into my skin. But it's so, it's almost like my religion in a way because it's such a part of me that it feels healing and alive and um, warm. And I know that I'm taking the care I need to take on my body. For so many years, I did not love my body. I didn't want to touch my body. I was a victim of gang rape and I hated my body. And to be in a place now to just lather it with cream and oil is like the best feeling I could ever have because I now, even though I'm a little bigger than I usually am and I'm a little this or a little that, like where most people are like, oh, she may not like her body. I love my body and Keeping it moist and beautiful and glistening and soft, oof, that's everything. That's everything to me.
Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp, and some related words from me. Last year, I was approaching an event that, in the past, brought up a lot of stress. So rather than attempt to get through it all on my own, I tried better help. I had several live sessions with my therapist, who was a great fit for me. She even gave me this exercise that I still use. If you have a lot on your plate, you're having trouble sorting through conundrums, consider getting similar support through better help. It's more affordable than conventional therapy and entirely online. After completing a survey that touches on important information about where you're at and what you're seeking, you'll get matched with a therapist. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash girlboner today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash girl boner. This episode is supported by Athletic Greens. I added AG1 to a smoothie today with almond milk and banana and peanut butter, and it was delicious. And I also love knowing that I got a range of vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and more sourced from whole foods. Plus, AG1 is designed to promote daytime alertness and sleep quality. Athletic Greens founder struggled with lots of gut health issues, and he created AG1 to help folks invite more wellness without having to take a ton of supplements. To make things easy, Athletic Greens is offering you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just visit athleticgreens.com slash girlboner. I also love that for every purchase they donate to organizations that get nutritious food to kids in need. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash girlboner to quote, take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. How we frame and talk about our pleasure practices can make a difference too. One thing that really struck me about these pleasure practices, nobody said, I just sit there, open my mouth, and someone pours chocolate in. They all took effort. A lot of them took time. And that is something that you brought up in our process because the way we wrote the book is we would have these pretty much weekly recording sessions together, Skype or Zoom, and talk through these common questions that people ask when they're struggling. And I remember you saying that pleasure really, it takes that effort. And it really, really struck me on a personal level, like looking back on my own journey and my difficult times. And I think sometimes we don't have the capacity. If we don't have the capacity to make an effort, to me, that seems like a red flag of, I need support. Yeah. But also I find that it's, it's an easy thing to fall into where if you're really exhausted, emotionally drained, it's kind of easy sometimes to just kind of ignore pleasure. What can you share about that, that, that effort that it takes? It's, I, I love words. I'm a literary person. And so words are, to me, every word is a little book. I personally spend a lot of time being very careful about the words that I choose. I won't usually think in terms of effort. I will think in terms of choice, power, agency, creativity. All of these are generative words and there is a forward movement to them, kind of embedded in them is movement. Trauma is kind of a stuckness of the body and of the nervous system. She pointed out that with everything we are living through right now, from living on a planet that is profoundly injured to the entrenched problems with the pandemic. So many things feel stuck. And the only way that I have figured to even think about moving through is words of movement, of creativity, of something generative. And we don't have to do it alone. We actually should not do it alone. There are things that we can do within ourselves 
Jamila told me that she has trained herself to see difficult times as a signal of, I need to go paint. I need to just look at the hummingbird feeder, but I need to go be creative in some way and get life back. What I invite people to do is to practice recognizing those signals when you feel out of capacity. That's the signal to do something creative. It can be little. It can be painting your nails. Sometimes just organizing something very small. It can be going outside. It can be running some just cool water or lotioning your hands. But something that is generative for you. That's the way through to the next moment. So in chapter eight, which is called, how can I get my life back? You wrote in your reflection section, this line that just really moved me. Given the relentless intensity, we are having to survive every day. It's important to make sexual and sensual connection, a ceremony or ritual, or to slow down enough to taste every part of it. Why can slowing down be helpful? Our brain and body, which is really the same thing, can't focus on two things at exactly the same time. And so if somebody, if we dive into an experience and expand that experience, that becomes the world for that moment. And those series of moments, that becomes the world. The coolness of the water, the ripples as it moves over one's skin, that can become this place of replenishment and relief. And even though the other stuff is still waiting outside of that moment, you can really create, to me, I think of it like a sanctuary, like this lush garden that really is accessible at any time. And the more that we know that that, that our body learns that that is accessible, that that sanctuary is there anytime we choose to go into that moment, I think it it gives us a lift. And again, it, it gives us that energy to deal with all the other things that are happening. It seems to me that when we make pleasure a priority and practice it, have pleasure practices and rituals in our lives beyond sex, if we are people who enjoy sex, that it really impacts how we feel during sex. It impacts whether or not or how we desire sex. Could you share a little bit about that? If we practice pleasure in all these different aspects, we're priming ourselves to have more pleasure, more expansive pleasure, or more nuanced pleasure in sex. She said the same goes for having delicious, nuanced, exploratory sex. The pleasure trickles out to the rest of our lives. It's hard to be really, really upset when you've had great sex. Mm -hmm. And then you have to like go and there's bad traffic. The bad traffic isn't as bad because you had some great sex. and You're like, well, you know. (laughs) At least you're glowing. Exactly. Like I'll just glow a little bit longer on the 405. So, but it is that element of, What you practice is what becomes your life. And if you're practicing in sex to be truly in relationship with yourself, truly in relationship with your partner, truly playing, exploring, and seeing what that process between you two is going to be, that again primes us for more nuance, more ability to navigate relationship outside of sex and vice versa. The outside can then influence how we have sex. Yeah. Ah, that's wonderful. One of my favorite things to talk about when someone says that they are feeling like they've lost sexual desire or they are having trouble receiving sexual pleasure is the conversation around how does pleasure play into the rest of your life? I think it's so common. And I'd love to hear if this is your experience when you're working with clients for people to kind of hyper-focus on this quote-unquote sex problem. Do you find that to to be something that comes up for folks? Yeah, all the time when they're struggling with sex, it it becomes work. 
you know, this is America. And like, you, if you're going to do something, you have to be excellent at it. Like I have to do good work. She said it takes people into a place where there is no pleasure or sense of restoration. It's just, I'm failing, they're failing, or we're failing. And nothing erotic or sexy can happen in that space. And that can shape how we conceptualize our sex lives. When that comes up during a therapy session, Jamila asks, How does pleasure and how does that kind of similar mindset show up in other places? Because it almost always does. The pressure and the intensity and the uncompromising focus on this must work, good, bad, like it, it shows up in other parts of their life. And so it, it has been kind of counterintuitive for folks when they start asking about pleasure and other aspects of their life. And they're like, well, I came to you to talk about sex, like fix the sex thing. And I'm like, I am just not in the way that you think. <laughs> you're not broken. So we're not going to be fixing anything. We're going to be expanding things. And so I'll start asking them, what are the scents that you like? What are the colors that bring you joy? What textures? How can you bump up your relationship to your body in other ways that we can then transfer over into your sex life? What are the expectations you have about your body, your partner's body, what sex is, that old programming about, you know, sex is orgasm and sex is penetration. That's not always helpful. It can be so much more than that. How do we slow down, go deep, and expand moments that then become rich and one of your favorite words, that luscious? What you just shared about our ideas about sex made me think of El's story in the book mm -hmm. because he does not experience orgasm with a partner. And for a penis haver, for a cisgender man, that's like not even in existence in our culture. Right. People don't have language for it. So I can only imagine he's definitely not the only one. But if you never hear it. Right. Then inevitably one would think I am alone and thus there is something wrong with me. And then if you get that kind of words told to you about that, then it just compounds of feeling alone, wrong, weird, strange, and all those very painful things that don't help us feel good in our bodies and in our lives. And then we'll sometimes seek validation in other ways. And so again, understanding Similar to neurodivergence, there's like, there's bodily divergence of how orgasm happens, what pleasure for one person feels like. She shared a personal example. I don't like cold things on my body. Like that's, you know, people are like, oh, the ice cube down the body. I'm like, I will inadvertently smack you. Like, it's just like, it's a body reaction. I don't, it does not feel good to me. But for other people, it's incredibly, ah, oh, just sends them. What I'm hoping is people um, kind of create their own palette of their pleasures, you know, and understanding that if it's not on the palette, get a new tube of paint, see if you like it. But it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you if you don't orgasm from penetration or don't orgasm from oral sex. I would encourage people to slow down. Because I think a lot of us are zooming through sex because, you know, it feels good. And we usually want that which feels good to be harder, faster, stronger. And so the practice is kind of throttling down and slowing down. But is something really, you slow down and it's still not the thing? Okay. There is absolutely something else. I love that bodily divergence because it turns it into this exciting what's unique about me? What's cool about me? Not what's wrong with me. Yes. There it is. There it is. Go find what's absolutely rad about you. Yes. Yes. Oh. So throughout this whole book process and the writing of it and all of these, we talked about some of the challenges that were coming up. This book was a hard book to write and to create, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very challenging, very challenging. How did you practice pleasure? How did you find, did you find pleasure 
in the process? One, I am so thankful that we wrote this together. I know if I had to write it alone, if I had come up with the idea and had to write it alone, I don't think I would have been able to complete it, quite frankly. Between uh, the depression that I manage and the pandemic and the uprisings, I get just to try to do this alone. I, I, I know I would not have been able to do it. So finding pleasure through our process, it was really the reminder of, you know, the, the title was staring at us, you know, and staring at me. And so there was, I had the reminder of that is, that is the practice. And if I do not use that as, well, as this support, as this anchor, that, and if I, if I fall into that trap, that productivity trap of we have a book to write and you've got to do it and it's got to be perfect and, you know, you've got to like get it done. And, and there were definitely times where, you know, we had conversations and I was not okay. You know, I had not done everything that I wanted to do in between one meeting and the next meeting. But again, in having the book, I had to come face to face with, I have to practice pleasure. If I'm going to do this book, I have to do these practices. And so some of the things I would do, you know, us meeting once a week, that was incredibly supportive for me. And it was a pleasure. It was great to catch up with you. And then I was not alone in trying to do the work. I would write and then I have this um, swing chair that I really love. And so after I would write, I would go into the swing chair and just kind of, and there's something really beautiful about being supported and just swinging. Well, that's as a kid, I loved being on swings. So it was, as I was writing, it was really this practice of what will help me come back to my body? What will be a nice, not reward, but present to myself when I've done the work of the day? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that framing. A, a present at the end of the day is really lovely. Something to look forward to. Mm-hmm and anticipate and, and celebrate yourself and what you accomplished and just really take care of yourself in that way is, is lovely. You were helpful for that because of my, just how I grew up that very much like just be excellent, do what you need to do, execute. And the idea of celebration is not something that that's not familiar to me. That's not a a somatic experience that I have, Mm. that I have. I want to celebrate everything. I'm like, we finished a chapter. Let's celebrate. And you're like, what? <laughs> we have, you know how many other pages we have to write? <laughs> but we have other things to write. And you're like, this is so great. I was like, well, I guess it actually is, isn't it? And so your practice of celebrating things was absolutely became for me a pleasure. Which shows another benefit of community, which I've learned so much about through this process and from, from you about the importance of having community. I needed community in this book, and I'm so fortunate that it's been you and also our family of interviewees. But those weekly meetings, it's interesting because one thing that was really hard for me through, well, all of last year for sure I had so many appointments and I need a lot of spaciousness in my days. And it's just how I thrive. Time management is very difficult for me with like clocks and schedules. And, and so I would get stressed out about having all of these like appointments. But when I had hours, like I was so happy to be there. It felt so affirming to me, which tells me how powerful that community piece is because it made those challenging pieces for me like a non-issue essentially because we are in this together and I have someone else also to support because I I want this book for folks. I also want you to have as positive of an experience as possible. I feel like we were always encouraging each other in these different ways because we bring different strengths to each other. That's probably what community does when you're seeking pleasure, when you're trying to find folks who have a, an experience similar to yours so that you have that sense of unaloneness, that you are not really alone. I mean, that's what I would love for people to take away is because we 
the the experience of of community can can be so subtle we don't always notice how critical it is until we have a chronic lapse of it or, or chronic absence of it but it's it's like air we literally need community or we are going to die it is that stark what i hope people do as they're reading the book is keep that in the back of their minds as they're reading Every single person in this book, yes, they did things individually to within themselves to practice pleasure, to get towards more healing and wellness, but every single person had some kind of relationship, some kind of community. Nobody here was a vacuum. Nobody here was an island. And so what I'm really hoping people realize is like having the right folks around you, the right team around you. This is what's going to allow you to thrive. And that's not bad. That's exactly how we keep living. When I spoke with Robert and Hannah about their pleasure practice, they also shared some encouraging words that feel like a good way to wrap up today. We participated in this to show that, you know, people who might be struggling, that there is a way out and there is a way that you can find happiness. You know, we're, I think, living proof of that. You know, Mm -hmm. life is not all, you know, roses all the time. There's, There's still struggle, but we, you know, found a way to move past that. Yeah, I, that's what I was thinking too. When when I was thinking about, is there anything else that I would want to add? Just and it is. It's just that hope that you know, pe- for people that are maybe at the beginning of this journey, and it's still so raw and so painful and so all consuming, and you don't know if you're ever gonna get to a place in your life where this isn't yeah. everything. You know, all I can share is my own experience. Is that you know, it does change and it does get better and there is healing. And, you know, these kinds of experiences, no, you don't walk away from them. There's never a point in your life where you're not a survivor of this anymore, but it, it changes and it can change to a place where you feel like you are living your life now and your life now is good. If you are enjoying Girl Boner Radio, I would so appreciate it if you would post a review on Apple Podcasts or the iTunes Store. And please do tell your friends about it. Thank you so much for listening. Jamila, I'm so grateful to have you here. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. How tightly linked do you feel that eroticism and creativity are? You mentioned orgasm, Mm. spurring creativity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say, I mean, eroticism and creativity, I consider them almost the same thing. Usually people hear the word eroticism and they immediately think sexual, which is fine because that's an element. When I'm lecturing, I talk about Audre Lorde's essay, The Power of the Erotic, And she talks about the erotic as life force, as the thing that moves us, the thing that when you see art, when you hear music and your body just moves towards it because there's something creative there, there's some possibility there. And so to me, eroticism is that thing 
like this project, like Girl Boner, when you first started, there was, I imagine, no external like support or enthusiasm. That was, I have to do There were a lot this. of gasps and odd looks. Right. But <laughs> yeah. inside, I imagine, there was this like- Fire, yeah. Yes. This mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. force, this yeah. creativity. Yeah. You couldn't not keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, like if we- had sex like that, where we follow the thing that feels good because we're curious just to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. If we did our businesses like that, what would change? How do you describe gender and what the binaries are? The gender binary is like there's only men and women and there's only the gender you were assigned at birth and that's your real gender and none of that's actually accurate. Every single one of us has a different gender identity and also a different gender, like makeup, like chromosomally, hormonally. So there is no like, this is a true woman, this is a true man. All of it is a complete, I don't even think like spectrum, like it is a magnificent garden. Mm. Um, infinite variety. That. Infinite, infinite variety. garden. And so it becomes a matter of, again, stepping away from, you have to be as close as possible to one side or the other. And it becomes, what is my deepest expression? That may change. That may like I identify as a femme. Like I love my nails. I love my hair. I'm very much connected to my body as a way of knowing. That's not a masculine linear. Like I have to have like an objective reason for how I feel. Like I've been taught to distrust how I function in the world, and it's taken me years to realize like that's another way of knowing that's as legitimate as like this reason equals this reason. You know? Yeah. So that's how I would describe it, of like, the binary is one more lie, like, stop believing that and start being your particular gender expression, you know? Like, I mean, even guys, like cis guys, and I work with a lot of cis straight men and, oh my God, like, so trapped. Like, that's that's why I love working with them, why it's very painful. They are so trapped in, this is what it means to be a man. Mm. They don't actually know a lot of times what they truly like, what they truly want. They, they're they like, oh, my penis is like getting sucked and that's great. But they don't know other areas of their body that feels good. Like they're, they are a mystery to themselves. You work with people who are going through different types of trauma or healing from trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what role mindfulness plays in, do you use the phrase healing from trauma? I don't. Great question. I don't use the word healing from trauma. I talk about trauma management. I love that. And mindfulness has everything to do with managing trauma. Which ties into that definition, too, because mindfulness has so much to do with observing. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's so easy to fight our feelings and, right. and shame them. Yes. Yeah. Which is the, that's the, the secondary trauma. Like the thing happening is bad enough, but then we learn to shame that response or shame what comes from that instead of this is the response that I have to that. Yes. And like, and welcoming or at least allowing that to happen. So we talk about trauma management and I have my own trauma and I, I have learned how to, what I call kind of step into the storm and like something is happening right now. And that's, that's what needs to happen right now. Mm. Yeah. That's so huge. I remember going to a therapist, and you, you might hear this a lot. Mm -hmm. I went in saying, like, hello, I've been triggered a lot, and I need to stop being triggered. Like, I'm here to have the triggers surgically removed from my head and my heart, <laughs> and then I would like to be happy again. So here's right, some money. Can you fix me? Yes. <laughs> but yes. She was just like, um, and I remember hearing the goal is not to stop the triggers. And that was so hard for me to accept. It runs counter to everything in this culture, which is like improvement and development and like you are you want to be unstoppable and like you can do it if you just put your mind to it. And, and Which makes the shaming works. worse because mm -hmm. like the quotes you see online and some of the different sort of self-help gurus and stuff like that who have these these massive brands and you, and you think, oh, this, this person's they really popular, be, right? Mm -hmm. They must be really great at what they're doing. And they say things like, you can feel however you want to at any moment. Right. And you're like, well, then I must be broken because this mm. came out of nowhere. Right. All of a sudden I was fine. And now I'm like in this, in this, you know, flashback or I'm feeling angry. Like I must be broken. There must be something wrong with me. And I, I am furious with any of these self-help people who shame the responses that come to the body. Like I look at the body as 
in its own ecosystem, which means sometimes there's storms and sometimes they happen out of nowhere. And you just batten down. You don't control a storm. You don't go, I can't shame on the storm. I can't believe it's. Done. You just ride it out, protect Get your yourself. Umbrella, as, you yeah. Stay yeah. inside if you can. Get your like storm lantern yeah. and like be gentle until it's over and then come out and take stock. Really, what's interesting is the things that people can do to help themselves if they've got trauma going on are actually the same things you can do just to enhance your sex, which is slowing down, breathing, trying to like skin on skin contact if that's something that can happen for both people, gentle eye contact. Because a lot of us, we tend to like dissociate during sex or again, like have flashbacks and letting partners know like this is going to happen. Can you help me? Mm. And like helping me like just hold my hand. You know, how does a person know when they need more help than they can give themselves? So, mm. someone who's fighting these feelings or mm -hmm. feeling very triggered, going through some sort of after effect of trauma, mm -hmm. and they're trying to meditate and they're trying to breathe and all this stuff, but they're not they're not quite getting to where they can thrive. Yeah, because that's really the goal, right? Is not to just like survive, but to thrive. What I would say is, one, healing happens through the relationship. Like harm happens through relationship. And so healing can only really happen through relationship and recovery through relationship. So you tell people like it's it depends on your context. So if you're noticing that your work life is suffering, that you are super harsh with yourself, you're very harsh with other people, that you've got symptoms of depression or anxiety or just a sense of like numbness. Maybe PTSD. Uh, right. If you're having flashbulb memories, definitely. If you have trouble, you know, like understanding where you are, like if you lose time in your day, things like that, like get support, get support and find somebody who is trauma informed because you can't. And this is what I is so painful. Usually it's really intelligent, deeply feeling people who come to me and they've been shamed around, and I should be able to handle this. I should be able to figure this out. And it's like, no, you need another person. And that's not bad. That means you're incredibly human. Mm -hmm. Like, please let somebody else support you. And that then, it's not and a find, weakness. That not it's, at all. It's, not at it all. takes courage and strength to, to seek help. Right. And it's a reasonable response. Trauma <laughs> is a reasonable response to extraordinary events. Your body is brilliant. The thing that happened or the thing that continues to happen, your body's like, okay, we're going to try to dissociate or we're going to freeze or we're going to try to be friends. Like we'll, we'll fawn because that will allow us to like get to the next moment, survive the next moment. Your body will find a way to help you survive. It wants you to survive. How it does that sometimes can feel painful afterwards, but your body was doing what it needed to do to get you to the next moment. That's its goal. Trust that. Trauma management what does that look like? I'm sure it's different for every person. Mm -hmm. um, I think that sometimes when we hear we're going to manage it, sometimes, you know, it might bring up fear around like, well, does that mean every day I'm going to feel like this? Is it going right. to stay like this? Yeah. And I tell people that as you start to integrate new practices, and I love the word practices because it's practice. It's not hitting the mark and doing it perfectly and it's going to immediately change. But as you do practices, the body does want to be well. And so it will adapt and then there's exponential growth. And I tell people, like, if you do this, you're never going to feel this bad again. I promise you that. Mm. You have new tools. You're not where you were before. You're older. You have different supports now. It will never be that bad again. And as you keep these practices and get external supports, community, books, groups to help you maintain that support, exponential growth. I mm. promise you. And rewards too beyond... Beyond what you could ever imagine. Like yeah. it's it's not that I think trauma like leads to breakthroughs. That's a horrible thought to have. Like, like you need to have trauma I've first. To, <laughs> right. In order to like, yeah, I've grown. Not yeah, at all. No. But it can be leveraged. It can be mm. great fertilizer. And you'll have an opportunity to know yourself because this culture is such a dissociated one. If you're going to survive trauma, you have to live fully to survive it and to thrive. And that's an amazing gift. Like I experience my life much more deeply as I've learned how to handle my trauma. And that's been an amazing, amazing like experience and gift. And the people in my life are the ones who like support my development and growth. 
And so I'm not just dissociating and putting up with stuff, you know, like I used to. Right. You have to be much more conscientious about right. who your circle is. Right. Who and amplifies all of that. you, yeah. who makes you feel erotic and alive. Reaching out to people in your circle, mm. did that come easy to you? Oh, absolutely on? not. Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Because I was like, I don't, yeah, that's hard. <laughs> when you're, I can't relate to people who, yeah, who haven't had to really like, start, like I have had very, very like difficult nights of the soul. And I was raised to be very independent. I was raised like, you go find the answers. The answer is somewhere you just need to keep looking for it. You're smart. So go, go figure it out. And so asking for help and being vulnerable, it felt dangerous. Wow. It felt dangerous. And as a black woman, like, to some extent, it is dangerous to be vulnerable. Like, even in the mental health field throughout my training, I learned, unfortunately, that I could not relax all the time. I could not be vulnerable, that that would trigger off somebody trying to shut me down mm. or that I would be perceived because I was feeling something as now angry and then too much. Wow. And so I also try to support people of like the tools you've picked up since your trauma can be still useful. I will tell people like you don't need to get rid of those old coping tools. They can still be useful. We just want additional ones. Yeah, and using them on command or is this right. like, I'm disassociating for my entire life. Exactly. As a, right, <laughs> I'm just going to tune chronic. out right now because that person <laughs> right. is too dangerous much, to gone. me and goodbye. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which and is self-protection. Of, yeah. Right, because the body wants to protect itself. Yeah. But what happens if we can choose, oh, that thing that I used to be able to do, I can still do that. And now this is the moment to use it. Mm, that's like, beautiful. I want people to have that sense of, again, they're not broken. They have survived. They're continuing to survive. And the creativity is there. Mm. It sounds like for you, creativity is very um, synonymous, too, with our sexuality. Absolutely. And I don't know if that's kind of what I've discovered in the kink world, because it was the first place I'm like, oh, I can have an erotic experience and not have to have penetrative sex with somebody. Like, penetrative sex and eroticism and orgasms are separate? What? What, <laughs> what is this? This amazing heaven. Like, right. It it's was like incredible. alien planet or something. It, it felt like <laughs> it really did. Yeah. But once you know that, then so many things, you can be creative. Like, what's sexy to me? What's sexy to the other person? Like, where do we want to go in our minds and bodies? And then, like, it spills out into everything else. What are some of the first steps for someone who wants to have more creativity in their sex life? Maybe they're, you know, they're not in a any kind of community. This is their, their like first in step. In their head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much in their head. I was like, get connected to your body. One of my favorite movies is Amelie. Most people don't remember this scene, but there's a scene where she goes down to the market and like she puts her hand in a bag of lentils and you just see her feel them and how delicious it felt. Start there. Go through your life. I don't know if it's like, I was saying this before Maria Kondo, but she's brilliant. But find out what gives you pleasure. What are the scents that give you pleasure? What are the colors that give you pleasure? What are the sounds that give you pleasure? And start bringing that more into your life. And it will change. You'll start, like, I love suits. And I used to watch James Bond a lot. And now I realize, oh, I kind of am a suit fetishist. Like, I love suits. Like, I really <laughs> love suits. <Yeah. laughs> so, that's awesome. So you just keep kind of tracking what is erotic to you, what makes you feel alive. And then how do you deepen that? And then how do you really, like, integrate that into things that you do to your body? What do you listen to when you're playing with yourself or even just touching yourself? How are you touching yourself? Those are That's great questions. And I love that you mentioned things that are not overtly sexual. Because I think so often right. when we hear from people who are concerned about not being able to experience a certain kind of pleasure in sex, and usually it has to do with like penetrative sex and that's all they've learned about or right. – Right. shame or whatever. And so there's so much hyper-focus on, I need pleasure right there, right, right. when I need it. Right. And, and right. to give that space to say, in your life. Yeah. I've seen people who can have like very good sex, but it's very kind of rigid and siloed. And there's a, a sterility in the rest of their life. Whereas people who are a lot more integrated and curious and creative in their sex life, it does. It permeates everything else that they do. And I think it's that sense of layering into your life like it, you have to practice it's really that simple of if we're coming through life most of the time dissociated and not paying attention to our bodies and running them ragged and not listening to when they're hungry or tired 
But then suddenly we get in the bedroom and we're supposed to be like, come on, work, have an orgasm, feel good. How does that make any sense? It's like somebody so yelling true. at you, relax, have pleasure. <laughs> when you've like, we have not, we, what is what is that? What is this P word thing? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes maybe intentionally starting outside. Right. And then working, yeah. so like firming up the ground. Again, if you have a garden and it's like dry and hasn't been watered or fertilized, grow. Mm-hmm. I want something to grow right here, right now. Yeah. You have to get the ground ready. You have to make it... Well, ready. How has this work impacted your life? Has it had an impact on your own sense of self and sexuality? It's made me really grateful for the experiences that I've had. It's also made me very angry at what I would consider dumb luck. I've had my own not great experiences, but I've had a lot more great experiences than not. And what makes me angry is that it was just luck that that happened. There Our culture is so sick when it comes to sex that it was only an accident that something worse didn't happen to me. And I sit across from people who something worse has happened to and that things continue to happen to. Like if they are a person of color, if they're trans, if they're non-binary, if they are into things that aren't socially sanctioned, they are continuing to suffer. I can't stand that suffering. How do you manage the anger? Doing things like this, doing podcasts and speaking about this piece, the stuff that I write when I train other clinicians so that they're not part of the problem. I take the anger because, again, I think anger is not a bad thing. And again, a lot of us, particularly femmes and cis women, are taught that anger is bad and unladylike. You know, I've been taught, like, you don't want to be the angry black woman. They won't listen to you. And so I got rid of my anger. But of course, you can't get rid of anger. Right. It's going to go somewhere, right? Yeah. So now what I I think of it, what's righteous anger? Mm. And then use that again as a creative force. I'm going to create a presentation. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to lecture about this thing. I can't stand more people suffering around something that should bring such transformation and joy. More of that fuel and fertilizer, it sounds like. Yeah. That's really, really That'll be my bumper sticker. Sex. It's fuel and fertilizer. (laughs) That's the name of one of your books. You just decided. (laughs) Love it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Great questions. A true pleasure.